book of Genesis chapter 41, I want to read two verses, verse 51 and verse 52. Verse 51 and 52. Just two verses. Really what I want to preach about today is really, it really spans about 10 chapters. But don't get nervous, I'm not going to read 10 chapters. But I think these two verses really sort of encapsulate what I, what I believe God wants to get across to us today. Genesis chapter 41, verses 51 and 52, reading from the New King James Version. It says, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has called me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. I want to speak to you this morning from this subject. Fruitful in the land of affliction. Fruitful in the land of affliction. Many of us spend our time praying to get out of affliction. But I want to talk to you this morning about learning to be fruitful in your land of affliction. God, thank you this morning again for your presence that's here, your word. God, we pray we'll find a place of fertile rest in the hearts of your people. God, our hearts are ready to receive. Your Holy Spirit is here. We've worshiped and we've praised and we've acknowledged and reverenced your presence. Now, hearts, God, is fertile ground. And we, we want to hear your voice this morning. So I pray that you would quicken me. That you would touch me, God. Give me grace to preach what you put in my heart to preach. I pray that every person that's under the sound of my voice, God, that their hearts would receive. Their hearts would be encouraged and strengthened. And God, before we say amen, we pray this morning for Reverend Mike, who's representing LBHT this morning, and has been the past several Sundays. We pray for you to strengthen his body today. He's in a strange place where he knows nobody. But God, I pray that you help him to preach as a man from another world. Let your anointing flow in a supernatural way. Let there be deliverance. Let there be chains broken. And let the hearts of the people be encouraged. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Amen. Read to you this passage, these two verses this morning. There's a full backstory to this. But suffice it to say for the purposes of these verses that Joseph is in a land of affliction. And in that land of affliction, Joseph have, has figured out a way to remain fruitful. We find ourselves in the text this morning where Joseph has had two children in a strange place. And he says here, he sa it says, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, saying, for God has made me forget all the toil and all of my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Yeah. I wonder if there's anybody here in the house this morning that has ever visited or spent time in the land called affliction. Mm -hmm. You, you don't know how how you got there. All you know is that somehow you found yourself in a place. Yeah. When I talk about the land of affliction this morning, I'm not talking about a place of momentary displeasure or short-lived discomfort. The land of affliction, on the other hand, is that place where God seems so far away. It is that place where your prayers not only seem to be unheard, but also seem to go unanswered. Am I the only one that's been there before? It's a place where you feel as if your pain and your troubles have literally pitched a camp around you and moved in with you for good. The land of affliction is that place of what seems to be a perpetual trouble. You put a smile on your face, but inside you're asking God, why am I in this place in my life right now? And how long, God, do you plan to keep me here? You try to comfort yourself with the words of the psalmist in Psalms 30, verse 5, when he says that weeping may endure for a night. 
But joy comes in the morning time. How many would say this morning with me that sometimes it can seem as if morning never comes? And as if you're drowning in your own tears waiting for the light of day to come. I can tell you that this past probably four months, maybe six months or longer, has been one of those seasons in my life. I'm encouraged that I love the Lord, but it's been a season of what seemed to be prolonged pain and trouble. Anybody been there before? Oh, yeah. and, and, and I believe and I sense this morning that that's the story of some of you that are in this house. In fact, you've had trouble with you so long that you just learned how to deal with it and how to allow trouble to just post up beside you. You learn how to function at half throttle and how to just function even though you don't feel like you have all your faculties, you still find a way to move forward. You're functioning in the midst of land, in the land of affliction. Yeah. We seem to find ourselves there sometimes where affliction and prolonged pain just seems to have no end. Mm. Now, I know that some of you all are not in the land of affliction. Everything is bliss. All is well with you. Thank God for that. Everything is just how you want it. And just how you prayed for it to be. So I didn't come to talk to you this morning. I came to talk to those who are in a place where they prayed and it didn't seem to turn out how they thought it would. They sought the face of God and it just seemed to get worse instead of get better. And it's not like those times before, and I believe God is distinctly saying this to this morning. It's not like the times before when you've had moments of affliction and eventually it would lift. But it's one of those times where it seems like the darkness has stayed with you. And the cloud has hovered over you. And you cannot seem to find a way to find sunshine. That's who I'm talking to this morning. Well, I want to offer you some encouragement this morning, and I want to challenge you at the same time. Perhaps God wants you to shift your focus from wondering when he will free you from the land of affliction and ask him to show you how to be fruitful in your land of affliction. I want to tell somebody this morning that in due season, God will free you from your land of affliction. But he wants you to be fruitful in the process. There's nothing worse than a Christian who has the Spirit of God in them sitting idle and not being fruitful. In fact, he says that you didn't call me or choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit and fruit that will remain. You see, Christians are the only species walking the earth. That can live with no water and no sunshine in the spirit and still bear fruit. Yes, yeah. You hear what I say? Yes. Christians are the only ones walking this planet where everything around you can seem to be dying and there's no nourishment going to your roots and you can still thrive and live. God has called his people to be fruitful in the midst of affliction. Yeah. Yeah. Satan wants you to think that I'm going to deprive you of this and deprive you of that. And if I deprive you long enough, spiritually you'll dry up. But I learned that God did not operate the, the way we operate in this world. And God will give us the living water. He will give us more than what we can get from the physical and he will spiritually infuse you with water that will sustain you. Yes. Amen. The enemy likes to make you believe that because of your life circumstances, you are stuck where you are. You cannot be fruitful. And I love the fact that God makes his people fruitful no, no matter where they are. You can plant me in the middle of a parched and dry desert. And if the water of God is running through my veins, I'm going to be fruitful right in the midst of the desert. You can plant me in the middle of trouble and tribulation. And sometimes you can afflict me, but God's spirit is in me. And so I'm going to be fruitful where I am. Come on, if somebody need to hear this this morning. You can be in the midst of trouble and stuff can be falling down around you. And things don't go the way you want them to go, but you can be fruitful in the midst of your desert. Yeah. Perhaps God wants you to he wants you to shift your focus from wondering when he'll free you from the land of affliction and teach you how to be fruitful in the land of affliction. Can you be fruitful when God doesn't feel close? Can you be fruitful when things don't go how you want them to go? Can you be fruitful when the bank account is reading numbers that you don't want it to read? Can you still be fruitful? Is the question. 
I want to give you some background on this text quickly. We read in this chapter of Genesis 37 that God gave Joseph some dreams. And in his excitement, Joseph made the mistake of sharing these dreams with some folk who didn't like him too well. Joseph was like many of us in that God showed him a promise and something that he could look forward to. And Joseph got all excited when he saw the blessings of God, not knowing that this dream would actually be birthed through a season of pain. He had no idea that this dream would really take shape and begin to form, not while he was in his father's house, but while he was living in the land of affliction. Well, we know from the passage that Joseph's father and mother loved him dearly, but his brothers hated him with a passion. They despised the fact that he was favored by his father and that he was favored by God. And Joseph, in his naivete, in his naive ways, had the audacity to tell them the dream, saying they would bow down to him. Now, I don't know how many of you all are as bold as Joseph, but Joseph was bold enough to go to some brothers that didn't like him and say, just so y'all know, one day y'all going to bow down. I, I, I'm not sure how he, he, he got there, but, but he was so enraptured by the fact that God had showed him a glimpse of his future that he, he lapsed into a momentary lapse of judgment. Yeah. So in 37, chapter 37, we see that while he was going about his business and feeding his father's flock, that his brothers grabbed him and threw him into a pit. Hmm. They plotted to kill him, and if it wasn't for the advice of his older brother Reuben, they would have killed him. But Reuben said, don't kill him, let's put him in this pit here, because if we kill him, our daddy will die. He'll die from just the pain of his son being killed. And so they put him in a pit, eventually sold him to slaves who took him to Egypt. Took him to Egypt. The Egyptians hated the Hebrews. If there was any place that Joseph would rather go, it would not be Egypt. Somehow, these people happened to be going to the place that he would least likely to go. He would least like to go. And so they took him to Egypt, and he finds himself one day feeding his father's flock, and the next day in the land of affliction. Let me tell you something, in case you haven't noticed this yet in your Christian walk. Sometimes affliction just finds you. You're going about your merry little way, and you're on the mountaintop, and one phone call can release affliction in your life. One conversation can open the door from bliss to affliction. Joseph was in that place where it seems as though all was well. His dad and his mom loved him greatly. And he was like any other young child. And he had uh, problems with his siblings. But somehow he went from a place where things were well to this place where he was all of a sudden afflicted. Joseph was able to find a way to be fruitful. Why was he fruitful? First point. He was fruitful because he discovered that the land of affliction, hear this, can also be viewed as the land of his presence. He discovered that the land of affliction should also be viewed as the land of God's presence. In Genesis 39, 1 through 3, listen to these words. It says, Now Joseph had been taken to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Joseph's captain, uh, part of, uh, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. Listen to this. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a successful man, and he was in the house of the master, his master, the Egyptian. Listen to this. And the, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper. Yeah. 
Yes. Have you ever seen a child that's learning to ride a bike? And, 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 and the parent is beside them, holding them up as they run beside them while they ride the bike. Anybody ever seen that? Yeah. And, and before long, the child begins to balance the bike by themselves, even though the parent has let them go. They just don't know the parent is taking their hands off. And just the presence of the parent is enough for them to have the confidence that they need to overcome their fear of falling off that bike. Yeah. They have forgotten or didn't even realize that the parent had taken their hands off. But just the fact that the parent is running beside them, cheering them on, saying, you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. They begin to do that thing on their own. Sometimes just knowing that God is with you is enough to take you through the land of affliction. Yeah. He may not always free you from it, but if you know that he's there with you, if you know that he's beside you, you're willing to go through whatever you gotta go through. I don't know about you, but that's my story. Sometimes I say, God, I know I've got to do this. I know I've got to go through this, but just let me know you're here with me. If I know your presence is beside me, I can walk through this. I can go through this. Is that not what the three Hebrew boys experienced? They had to go into the fire, but the presence of God went with them. And I tell you that when God is with you, you can walk through any land. It doesn't matter how long you have to be there. If his presence is with you, you can stand in the midst of the land of affliction. My daughter this past week had a recital at her school. She don't want me to say this. <laughs> and it was a large crowd there. I was so proud of her. Me and her mom, we were so proud of her. But something caught my attention. I had to be mentioned. I don't know if you know. Something caught my attention. That while she's standing in front of this big crowd, and the composer is there telling them what to do and how to do it, She's, she's keeping her eye on that composer, taking her cues, but I noticed that every few seconds, she'd take her eyes off the composer and look out in the audience at me and her mom. Yeah. <laughs> and just for a moment, I wanted to tell the composer, you sit down, let me do this thing. <laughs> I felt proud because that, that girl of mine was looking at me. It was, it was her way of saying that I, I realized that where I am right now and, and what i got to do right now, and I, I realize there's a big crowd and I'm a little nervous and there's some anxiety right here, but if I can glance over every now and then and just see mama and daddy sitting there, then it's all right with me. If I can just see y'all and see the face and see the smile and that's telling me everything is okay. Can I tell you this morning that God is saying to you,
So it's okay. Yes, it is. If people reject you, it's okay. If you got some friends like Joe had, who didn't know how to encourage him in his time of difficulty, all they could do was tell him what he had done wrong. I think, Joe, you must have made a bad choice. You must have made a wrong decision. But how many know he's a friend that won't beat you down when you're down? He don't step on you when you're already down. But he'll be there to pick you up and yes, he will. and pray you in his heart. People may kick you to the curb. But God will never leave you. He's with you. On the mountain. Oh God. And he's with you in the back. You're going to see some valleys in your life. But he's with you no matter where you go. Even when it seems as though the pain is overwhelming. You're never alone. He is there. When the doctors give you a diagnosis that seems to be terminal, he is still with you. When the child becomes a living hell, he is still with you. When the bills seem to pile up and outnumber what you have in your bank account, he is still with you. When everything around you seems to consume you, he is still with you. That he will never leave you, yes. even in your darkest and most destitute place. Yes. Thank you, God. This is how the psalmist said it in Psalms 139. Ooh, God. He said, You searched me, O oh Lord, yes. and you know me. Yes. You know when I sit yes. down yes. and when I rise. Yes, God. Lord. Yes, God. Now, I know all y'all that know me know. Yes, I love my wife more than life itself. Yes, God. But I gotta tell you, I ain't there every time she sits down. Uh-uh. And every time she gets up. Yeah. I'm not there to think to think for her to know what's going through her mind. Yes. But till God says that every time every. you lie down, he's with you. And every time you get up, yes. he's there. He says, yes. I'm familiar with all of your ways. Yes. He says, before you even put oh, a word you. on your tongue, Lord, I know it all completely. I
that God was with him. Yeah. Ruth would tell you. She would say that she had to go to a faraway land that was not a land of her own, but while she was there, God was with her. Yeah. David would testify to you. And David would tell you that while he lived as a fugitive, running and living in the mountain crevices because of a crazy man that wanted to kill him, that God never left him. God was with him. The man of God, Elijah, Elijah would testify that he thought that he was one who was going to die because of an evil, demonic woman named Jezebel. But in that time, God spoke to Elijah and said, you may feel by yourself, but I am with you. And not only am I with you, you feel like everybody else is against you. But I've got a whole lot of folk here that is with me, and because they're with me, they are with you. If you go a little further and look at Daniel, Daniel would testify that while he laid in a hungry life then God was with him. God was with him. Isaiah sums it all up by saying these words. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not scorch you. Why? Because God is with you. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they come me. I'm preaching better than all amen this morning. He's with you no matter where you are. You might have a crazy husband, or a crazy wife, or a crazy boss, maybe a crazy pastor, but God is with you no matter where you are. To be well assured in your own spirit, and as you walk in the valley, and as you go to your knees with the wave of life hovering over you, that God is still there with you. And in due season, He will lift you up, and He will lift your head, and He will walk beside you. And just like Joseph, even in your affliction, even those haters will have to acknowledge. Joseph was in the land of affliction. God blessed him. But then there was this woman. Everybody say woman. I know it's like no men say woman. All that's going on in the news right now. You better not say woman. That's a joke. Those feminists out there, that is a joke. This woman, pretty woman, come on here. Beautiful woman. Joseph had been in a place where he sold from his family. He was in a place where he was rejected. And all of a sudden, this beautiful, sexy woman came and told him, I want you to lie with me. And, and Joseph, I, I've got to believe, the scripture tells us, I know it's pretty, the scripture tells us that Joseph resisted it, but i got to believe that Joseph was like you and me. It's all right to say amen. amen. He had been sold away from his family. And it's logical to think that while he was by himself as a slave, that just for a moment, his flesh might have said, come on here, man. You deserve this. You've been sold and, and, and you've been neglected and you've been abused, but Joseph never lost his integrity. And the Bible says that this beautiful woman, how do I know she was beautiful? Well, I know she was beautiful because she was the wife of Potiphar. She was the wife of a high-ranking official in that place. She was a woman who knew how to take care of her man, but she had a long eyes on Joseph. And so I believe that every time Joseph would come in the house, every time he would come there from 
work, she would just kind of walk and prance in front of him and say, look at that thing right there. Now she would pull that to us. Come on. And, and the Bible says that day after day, don't act like you don't know how to do it. The Bible said that day after day, she would come past Joseph. Come on. This is the most burden I'm getting, so I'm going to take it while I can. I got to get burdened in church because I can't get it at home. I got four children. I can get it at home. But every day the Bible says she walked past him and she would flirt and she would flick her hair and she would say, look at what you are missing out on. We can do this thing and nobody would ever know. And the Bible says that one day she grabbed a hold of Joseph and Joseph said, ain't no way in the world I'm going to resist uh, uh, my own God and, and do what I know is evil in his eyes. And he left, and the Bible says he left his cloak in her hand. <laughs> getting a little too far, a little too far. <laughs> the Bible says that Joseph left and his cloak was in her hand. And, and when he left his cloak in her hand, she framed it. The Bible says she went to all of the servants of the house. And, 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 and she went over there. And she told the servant of the house, and she pointed, she told that servant, she pointed, she said, that man tried to take advantage of me. The servant of the house said, don't worry, I know who the king is. I'm going to talk to Paul, bro, we're going to get this thing straight. And the servant went and he snitched. And he told the king, Potiphar, and Potiphar got angry, the Bible says, and they threw Joseph in jail. Thank you, PYT. <laughs> Only some of y'all gonna get that. We got it. Let's keep on. Threw Joseph in jail. I gotta think that maybe Joseph then his flesh start talking again. Fool, if you'd have just, you could have not have been in here. You wouldn't have been in here if you'd have kept going on about your business. But the Bible says Joseph kept his integrity. Amen. Yes, amen. What is my point here? My point is this. That whenever you find yourself in the land of affliction, Potiphar's wife or husband will always look for you. Yeah. I'm not just talking about a man or a woman. I'm talking about Satan bringing you propositions and things to say. If you just make this choice, you can get out of this affliction really quickly. If you just do this, it'll make things so much easier for you. It's not always in the form of a man or a woman. Sometimes it's in the form of just telling a real little white lie. Sometimes it's in the form of just cheating a little bit that nobody else will figure it out or find it out. Sometimes it's in the form of just letting down your standard a little bit and say, you know what, I don't typically go for this, but this one time, I'm going to go ahead and go for it because that's your escape out of the land of affliction. But can I tell you, Joseph set a good example for us. The Bible says that he didn't just tell her no, he fleed, he ran from that place, and while it landed him in prison, he kept his integrity. Imagine that. He was thrown into prison for doing the right thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Have you ever walked into the land of affliction just for doing the right thing? Joseph finds himself there. God, I've been doing everything you told me to do. I've been faithful. I've been in fellowship with the saints. I've paid my tithes. I've done everything you've asked me to do. But somehow I'm being punished for doing the right thing. You all say amen. We all been. Amen. I, 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 I'm doing what I know to be the right thing to do. And somehow it seems like things get worse for me. I came to talk to you this morning, those of you that have been there, to tell you you're in your land of affliction, that's all that is. And in your land of affliction, God is there, but also recognize that Satan is there. You remember the story when Jesus came off the mountain of fasting and praying? And you know who met him right there? It was in between the time of consecration and the time of he actually beginning to operate in his calling. It was in that gap 
of time that Satan met him and tried to derail the plans of God because he knew that Jesus was hungry and he felt that he was probably vulnerable. Satan will always sniff. He will sniff out your vulnerabilities and he will find your hunger and he will try to offer you something to satisfy your hunger. But don't be fooled in your land of affliction into giving in to the propositions that you know to be outside of the plan yep. and the will of God. Yes. Joseph was thrown into prison for doing the right thing. It prolonged his pain, but it also birthed his purpose. In verse chapter 39, verse 21, it says, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper in the prison. Yeah. No matter how much they tried to hold him down, God would bless him wherever he went. Amen. Even when he was in the prison, the Bible says God gave the keeper of the prison favor with him. Yeah. Yeah. Put him in charge of the prisons. Yes. You know, when, you, when, you, when you've been marked by God, yeah. it don't matter where you go. Yeah. Folk will notice, they got to take notice. Yeah. That's why when you've been marked by God, you, you got to realize that even when you try to go the wrong way, People take notice that you got something on you that they don't. Yeah. It's either going to help you or it's going to hurt you. Yeah. It's going to help you if you're in God's will. It's going to hinder you if you're trying to walk outside of God's will. Because people who see the mark of God don't know what to name it. All they know is it's different. Uh, That's why they're unfair to you. Because they see something they don't know what to name. Yeah. They can't name it. But for some reason it grips against them. Yeah. That's the mark of God. Joseph was able to remain fruitful. Second point. Here's another reason why Joseph could remain fruitful, fruitful in his land of affliction. Joseph discovered the land of affliction has to also be viewed as the land of promise wasn't just affliction, it was the land of promise. Remember the dream we talked about where Joseph told his brothers where that dream was only fulfilled through Joseph's affliction. Mm -hmm. The road of promise is often filled with pain and affliction. Yeah. Oftentimes there are disappointments and setbacks yeah. posted up all along the road of promise. Yeah. I want you to know this morning, it may seem to make no sense to you right now. Your promise, however, is tied to your affliction. God uses your affliction as a launching pad of his promises. Yes, amen. Let's say that again. God uses his, your affliction as a launching pad for his promises. Joseph didn't realize it, but he was smack dab in the middle of where God needed him to be in order for the promise to come to pass. Yes. In that prison is where, hear this, in the prison is where destiny and God's timing intersect. Yes. Okay. Wow. In prison is where destiny and timing Intercept. Amen. Bible says Joseph met two prisoners that were there. One was the chief butler. The other was the chief baker. And they had dreams while they were in there. And it just so happened, but how many know it didn't just so happen? Right. It just so happened that this butler and this baker were connected to the king, to the pharaoh. Yeah. And when they had their dreams, the Bible says that uh, Joseph began to interpret their dreams. There was only one caveat to Joseph's interpretation. He says, when you get out, please remember me, hoping that somehow he might expedite his freedom from his affliction. Yes, amen. But it was two years later at the appointed time, what some call due season, if you will, that the butler remembered Joseph and told Pharaoh, he says, I know a man. Amen. 
Uh, the butler says, forgive me, somehow my memory has lapsed and two years ago I was supposed to tell you this. I believe that God took a, a memory a memory blanket and put it on the butler's head and for two years kept it there. And at the right time, he removed the memory blanket and said, now is the time because destiny and timing has got to intersect. And the Bible said that when this butler said that to Pharaoh, Pharaoh had a dream. Pharaoh said, send, bring him to me. You see, Pharaoh had to be desperate in order for him to bring and call Joseph. He had called his magicians and all of the people who would serve him, but I believe the same way he put a memory blanket on the butler's head, he blinded the eyes of the magicians. He said to the magicians, you need to interpret this dream for me, but they could not figure it out. And then the butler says, you know what, I know this guy that I was in prison with. He was a weird kind of guy, you know? He didn't seem like he belonged there. He seemed like a guy who was a nice guy. He was a good guy, but somehow he got into prison because he was accused of rape. And, and Pharaoh, while we were there, I don't know nothing about this man's God. You see, I'm an Egyptian, and I serve false gods, but he told me about my dream and he interpreted it for me and he said, I want you to remember me when you get out. And Pharaoh, it's been two years, I'm so sorry, but I remember this man. Pharaoh says, go get him right now. I want to tell somebody this morning, it's almost your go get him moment. It's been a long time in the land of affliction, but God set some things in order in order for timing and destiny to intersect. My God, I'm preaching right now. Preach, Pastor. Pastor, you need to preach that. It's been a long time for you, but it's all because God was just waiting for destiny and timing to meet at the right moment. And the Bible says Pharaoh was desperate and he said, go get him right now and have him to tell me my dream. And I love the fact that Joseph said, it won't be me that'll tell you uh, your dream, but it'll be the God that I've served that'll tell you your dream. And he began to interpret the dream. And a long story short, Pharaoh said that your destiny and your timing is today. And he says, you're not going back to jail. Not only are you not going back to jail, I'm not sending you back to Potiphar's house. I'm going to leapfrog you. You're going to go over Potiphar and you're going to be second only to me. Let me tell you something. When God favors you, you better stop all Yeah. 
all of your pain always has a purpose. There's nothing that just happens in your life just for the sake of happening. It's God birthing your purpose and your destiny so that you can walk in the plans that he's intended for you to walk in. And I know sometimes you feel like I'm on the mountaintop and I've already graduated from that. And sometimes God will pull you back down and say, you haven't quite graduated yet. I've got to keep you in this place until I can totally perfect you and mature you. But in those times, I'm encouraging you. Realize that the water of God can still nourish you even though you're in a dry and barren and parched place. The water of God will nourish you and strengthen you in those places. I know I got to finish. God said, now is your time. The third, third reason that Joseph was able to remain fruitful in the land of affliction, listen, is because Joseph discovered that the land of affliction is also the land of provision. Uh -huh. I, I, I know you're looking for provision here and there. You're looking for God to give you what you need here and there. But in your land of affliction is where God actually offers you provision. Bible says Joseph told Pharaoh there's going to be seven years of plenty. And then there's going to be seven years where there is nothing. And, and in this time, Joseph's brothers, uh, during this season that God provided, Joseph's brothers and his family were able to eat all because there was a season of plenty where Joseph was able to get provisions. Sometimes your provision resides exclusively in your affliction. I need to say that again. Sometimes your provision resides exclusively in your affliction. You can't get it anywhere else. Children of Israel left Egyptian bondage. They went into the wilderness. They were afflicted for 40 years. Mm -hmm. But the Bible says God gave them manna. Yeah. Provision. Amen. Yeah. Where manna means, what is it? Yeah. God was saying, I am everything you need, whatever you need. Yeah. In your land of affliction, I am it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Bible says they came to a brook called Meribah. And they were thirsty. Mm -hmm. And the waters were bitter. And they were in need of, of water. They were thirsty. And the Bible says that God made the water sweet for them so that they could drink. That was their provision. Yeah. I'm simply encouraging you today to not take the posture of the Israelites in your land of affliction. Yeah. They were complainers and they were people who were frustrated and they would rather go back to the place where it seemed easier and God was saying to them that in your affliction is where my provision resides. Yeah. And if they had just stuck with the plan of God, that first generation would have made it to the promised land. Yeah. I'm simply trying to get you from Egypt through the wilderness into the promised land. The first generation did not make it because they did not understand that there will be opportunities and propositions to get them off course and that their provision was living and residing in the land of affliction. And so it took an entirely new generation for God to take them to the land of promise because the first generation didn't understand. Joseph walked through this land. And he was allowed, the Bible says, to live in the best part of Egypt. <coughs> Provision. I venture to say he had far more in Egypt than he ever would have had living in the house of his fathers. The Bible says that he went to this place. Genesis 47, 6 says, the land of Egypt is before you. Not only you, Joseph, but the Pharaoh says, have your fathers and brothers dwell in the best of the land. You can't make it better for somebody else until you get to your promised land. Amen. Right. Right. Amen. 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 
Some of us are trying to uh, fix it for everybody else while we all walking in our land of affliction. And God is saying, you need to get to your promised land and the outflow of your promised land will then be sustenance and provision for those that you're trying to pull alongside of you. So God is trying to teach us how to understand what it means to be fruitful. So what's the conclusion of the matter? I'm close. Get ready to close. The conclusion is this. Joseph discovered that the land of affliction was the land of God's placement. Amen. I want to read something to you. In chapter 45, verse 8, listen to these words. Listen. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Imagine this young man being sold from his family to a foreign people who hate him. His brothers come to him and he says to his brothers, it was not you who sent me here. Wow. We love to blame everybody. It's the pastor's fault. If he would have made this decision, it's my wife's fault. It's my husband's fault. It's my boss's fault. If they just would, sometimes it's God's will to take you to a painful place and he has to use people as his vessel sometimes to get you there. And you turn your attention to the people without understanding that it really was the hand of God taking you where you need to be. Joseph said to his brothers, it was not you who sent me here. I know you put me in the pit and you hated me. I know you sold me to the band of the Ishmaelites. I know you sent me to a place that I would never want to go. I know that it was your hands, but it really was God using you as a vessel to take me where I need to go. What am I saying to you this morning? Sometimes you need to thank God for the closed door. Sometimes you need to thank God for the banker who said no. Sometimes you need to thank God for the leader that says, I'm moving you out. I'm setting you down. I'm transitioning you. It's not them. It's God doing his will to get you to your destiny.
time in due season. Destiny. And time. Will intersect. And what it does. The heart of all surrounding you. Will be where it needs to be. But God's plan and will. To go forth. Yes, you're going to hang the trees. I want to leave you this morning with some encouragement. Amen. We all have to go to the land of affliction from time to time. Yes. But don't ever think that the land of affliction is just there to hurt you. It's also the land of his presence. Yes. It is also the land of his promise. Yes. It is also the land of his provision. Yes. And always remember it's the land of his placement. Yes. It's meant for you to be where you are. Amen. God will be there with you. He will walk you through it. And you'll come out of pure gold in due season. Amen. I want to pray for you this morning. Because I sense in my spirit, I really believe there's some here today. Just like Pharaoh said to the butler, he said, Go get that young man and bring him to me. I believe that this is your go get that young man or woman moment and bring them to me. God is going to cause your purpose to intersect with his timing. And his perfect plans will come to pass. This morning, my altar call is simply this.